Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 41. Now, uh, it's impossible to know at this time, I've said this before, if the bear market is over. Uh, we've seen a small rise in prices since the start of the year, but we're now starting to witness those prices coming back down. We've seen that consistently over the last couple of months. And we're not back to where we started at the beginning of the year. Of course, we're still up nearly 7%. So prices aren't yet reaching new lows. Uh, but it's really difficult to know where we, it's impossible to know where we are. Uh, the question is, is this just a, a kind of a small spike in prices before we see new lows and the continuation of the bear market? That's entirely possible. You know, this whole little, this could be like a little, uh, what do you want to, you know, like a red herring, like a, like a decoy, like a, you know, we're going up a 6%, 7%. Everyone's like, oh, this is the start of the recovery. And then we just carry on going back down again. That's happened so many times before that it could totally happen again. Uh, it's very difficult to know if that is the case or we're in the recovery period already, you know, and we just don't know. We're not going to know until we look back at the the charts in the years to come and we can see what actually happened when you're in the middle of it. Impossible to know. You can't. You just don't know. So, you know, it could be the continuation of the bear market or it could be that we're in the start of what is inevitably going to be a slow recovery. And it's kind of pointless to try and predict that. You know, why waste energy on making those kinds of predictions when I could instead focus my energy on something that I can control? Now, amateur investors will often look at this period and they'll panic. They'll sell up and they'll run and then they'll wait for better times when prices have been going up for a while and then they'll jump back in. Now, that, of course, is quite probably, quite possibly one of the worst strategies for long-term investment that one could come up with because buying high and selling low and then buying high again, obviously that's foolish. It's not going to work. But having read years of annual reports by companies such as uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne online broker, uh, and it's a broker that I use, that is precisely what the vast majority of their retail investors tend to do. And they report in that and reports consistently that over many years, they see obvious patterns in investor behavior. For example, they always see a significant drop off of capital invested whenever prices fall and a slow but steady increase in capital being invested once prices have been rising for a while. And typically their clients can tend to wait two to three years of rising prices before they jump back in. It kind of confirms to a beginner uh, I don't know, the, the worst must be over and therefore it's safe to jump back in. And at face value, most of us could understand why that would be. But I suspect you know, many of us, many of you guys listening, have felt the pang of panic when prices fall. And then you felt that fear of getting your money back into the markets after a drop, wanting that assurance that you're not getting back in too early. But anyone who studied long-term investing and studied the, the great investors of history knows that that's not the way to make great returns. And how could it be, you know? Buying when prices are higher and then selling when they fall and then wait until they're higher again before buying is highly illogical behavior. Uh, and it's the behavior of an investor who's allowing their emotions to dictate their decision making and not logic. The simple logical rules of long-term investing are... One, buy great businesses only, only buying great businesses, well-performing companies. Two, only buy them when their price makes good financial sense. They've got to be priced right. Don't be overpaying massively on stocks. No matter how good they are, the price needs to be right. Three, only sell them if they no longer continue to be good businesses. So what a lot of people do is they'll, they'll determine their actions based on what the price is doing, which is highly illogical because the price is it's lagged to the performance of the business, but it's largely based on investors' emotions and the news that's happening right now and the short-term stuff that's going on. And when you then take a step back, what you see is the price is going up and down, up and down every day because of a bit of news that came out or, you know, something that's happened in the world. But when you take a step back, the profitable businesses that are run well, 
if you zoom out and you look at it on a yearly basis, let's look at a, a monthly chart over the course of 10, 15 years. If it's a good company, the price has gone up and the charts all look, you know, the, the diagonal line from bottom left to top right. And it's, it's a profitable business. It's done well. But obviously along the way, all the ups and downs that have been happening are caused by the news and the short term events that have been happening. I hope that makes sense. So we would only sell those stocks if they, for some reason, no longer continue to be good businesses, not because the price has fallen. You don't just sell a stock just because the price has fallen down. If anything, you might buy more. Because if you know the underlying business you're investing in, if you know they're making great profits, that they've got a really rosy future ahead of them, they're very exciting, you understand everything that's coming in terms of what are they working on, what's their growth strategy, what's the pilot in Germany doing, how's it, well is it doing, it looks like they're going to expand into Germany, and now they're talking about expanding into Hungary, this is going to be more revenue, more profits, very exciting. Now if the share price drops 10%, you don't just suddenly sell that stock if they're making great profits in the financials. So you only sell them if they they no longer continue to be that good underlying business. If, you know, if they're running at a loss every year or something, or they're just not making enough profit, and things look like they've, they're stagnated and they're not really going anywhere, you might consider, okay, this isn't as healthy a company as I thought they were going to be. Uh, but you that's the only reason I would sell a stock, personally. Uh, otherwise, number four, otherwise you hold them and buy more when the opportunities arise. And that is how you make money. You know the underlying businesses. When the share prices fall down in those companies, you buy more. Because your favorite company, the company that's making 20% net profit every year and is reinvesting into their own growth and everything looks amazing. Oh, look, their shares are 15% off right now. Now is the time to buy them because it makes sense relative to the underlying value. It's a very different mindset. It's logical investing, not emotional investing. And a shrewd, intelligent investor will fashion their investment strategy around this. And this therefore makes the market environment we find ourselves in today highly relevant because the entire market saw a drop in prices across 2022. And it's brought some stocks back to the same levels now in terms of pricing that we saw during the 2020 coronavirus outbreak. And so this indicates to the intelligent, shrewd investor that this is certainly not a time to sell those stocks and walk away. It's time to start sowing the seeds and to start getting ready. And by this, I mean it's time to start building your portfolio. Now, the caveat is that the intelligent investor must be buying the right stocks to maximize returns in the coming years. So if you're buying stocks like Tesco, BT, uh, ID, IDS, which is formerly Raw Mail, you know, Cineworld, many, many hundreds of other stocks that are out there that are not going to produce a strong share price growth. Some of these businesses are stagnant. They've done all their growing. And as a result, some have become dividend, what, we, what I would call dividend stocks. Companies that have reached their limit of growth and so now having to find new ways to attract investors by paying a, a 5% dividend each year instead of a 1% dividend. Now, stocks, those, those stocks' share prices can rise, but they tend to rise slowly at that point. They're not growing as a business anymore. They're taking a big chunk of their profit and giving it away to shareholders every year to keep them sweet, to keep them investing. But the company's kind of done its growing. It's not really going to grow much bigger than it is now. Now, that's not how I personally want to invest. Other companies are loss-making companies. Listen, I've, in, I've, I've done the analysis on 957 FTSE stocks. Trust me, the vast majority are losing money. They're not in good shape. Uh, investors don't like to invest in loss-making businesses unless they are certain of the company's future success. One uh, example of that might be Tesla. Tesla made a loss for many, many years. And then uh, and, and people were buying Tesla because they were certain that Tesla were going to do well in the future. I think that was a major risk, and it's not something I decided to get involved in. Uh, but it seems to have worked out at the moment because Tesla have just started to make a profit for the first time. And obviously the share price is now going up nicely. And those that did invest and take that huge risk are now getting some reward for that. I'm not. I'm, I'm a bit risk adverse personally, so it's not the kind of strategy I like to do. Because for every Tesla, there are nine others that didn't work out. 
and so you end up losing more money than you made. Uh, but, you know, that's just a different way of doing things, and there are many different ways of investing on the stock market. It's just not the way I like to do things. I just think it's too risky for me, but the rewards can be huge. Um, but many companies are loss-making out there across the FTSE, and, you know, investors don't like investing in loss-making businesses until they are certain of that future success, and that certainty is very rare. And so in most cases, loss-making businesses find their share prices falling, and usually that happens quite quickly. And again, that's not a way I want to invest. But a handful, a select few, are making over 10% profit every year, have wonderfully exciting growth strategies that I can get my little pea brain around. They have little to often no debt at all to worry about uh, that would otherwise eat into that profit or cause them problems. You know, if you've got a company that's carrying a load of debt, that might be okay. But as soon as something comes along that causes them problems, well, now they're not making the profit to pay off the debt. Now that's a problem. Whereas companies that are making decent, hefty profits that have no debt to worry about, all that means is that they're going to easily buffer. They're going to be able to cope with anything that comes along. They're also able to to finance those growth strategies by using the profit that they're making to reinvest into their own businesses. So as a result, these companies are not only growing in revenue and profits, but also in the value of their equity. Their equity being the assets that the business owns. Uh, minus all the liability that it owns and that gives you your equity value your net worth if you will uh, and so we see the net worth of the company growing as well you know they just they own more property and equipment or licenses or anything that you would class as assets those are the sorts of companies I want to invest in the companies I expect to be worth a lot more in 20 years than they are today and I therefore expect the share price of these companies to eventually reflect that and that is logical, unemotional, long-term investing that to me makes sense. But most investors, they can't invest that way. They just can't do it. And how could they? They don't know how to read the financial statements. They don't know how to interpret those financial statements as to what they're showing them. They don't have the time to read years worth of annual reports and interpret what these reports are saying and what they're meaning. They don't know what to look out for or how to tell the difference between one stock and another stock. They don't have the many, many hours it takes to do all this work. And so they'll tend to buy the likes of Tesco 20 years ago and be woefully disappointed with the 0% return that they've made over that period up to today. If you look back at Tesco and what they were worth 20 years ago, it was about £2.50 a share. Today, about £2.50 a share. You know, these these are people who will buy Cineworld because they love film and they enjoy the cinema brand. And they don't know anything about the financials of that business. They don't really know how to read that stuff. And then they watch in despair as the share price plummets because they had very high debt. They weren't making enough profit to pay off that debt. And so then as soon as COVID came along, this is before COVID, by the way. And then when COVID comes along and suddenly the cinemas are closed, they're in real trouble. Because not only are they now making no profit, but they're actually making huge losses because they've still got to pay staff. They've still got all of their liabilities that they own that they have to be paying. They've got all that debt that they've got to pay off and they've got no profit. And you know, however long that, that they were closed for, decimated those balance sheets and destroyed them. They didn't have reserves. You know, they didn't they weren't performing well enough prior to the the, the pandemic to weather it they were already in bad shape before it came along and then the pandemic came along and just finished them off and from the outside looking in you just think oh well just covid just destroyed Cineworld unfortunately no Cineworld were already in bad shape before covid came along it's just covid was the nail in the coffin for them unfortunately but if you don't do the analysis if you don't read the reports if you don't crunch all the numbers and learn what it all interprets and what it all means then you wouldn't know that necessarily and you'll just assume that COVID killed them off you know came along and just destroyed a good business it didn't they were already in bad shape but it was the final nail in the coffin for sure <clears throat> this environment that we find ourselves in right now this weird phase of the market where we don't know if we're going back up or if we're continuing back down further this is the time that a shrewd intelligent investor will pick out the businesses that are profit making reinvesting into their own future growth 
in a way that makes sense and then buys them for their portfolio. Assuming, of course, that price does make sense. There is no instant reward to the investor who uses this approach, the same approach as I do. So it's really difficult to feel any sense of accomplishment, like in the now, in the short term. Prices ebb and flow, they go up and down. And in the last five years, since the outset of this pandemic in 2019, prices have achieved very little in the last five years. But what's important to understand is that this phase is not going to last forever. And the amateur investor may sit on the sidelines and they'll be waiting for better days before getting in. And then they'll buy the wrong stocks once they do get back in. Once They'll wait for prices to go nice and high and they'll think, oh, I feel certain now that the bad times are over. Too late, you missed the boat. <laughs> uh, but they'll sit on the sidelines and they'll wait for all the prices to be nice and high before getting in and then they'll buy the wrong stocks. The shrewd investor already knows the right stocks that he or she wants and will be actively buying them as soon as they hit the sweet spot, the right price. And of the stocks that I have identified, approximately 35% of them are currently priced at a level that makes sense to buy. And I send a report out every week to my clients, to the membership that shows them of all of the companies that are on our list, we all know about them. If they've been members for anything longer than a month, then they've had several reports saying, oh, these are all the stocks. So they know the stocks well. And of those, these are all the stocks that have, that have fallen into their sweet spot. And that is a constantly changing dynamic as well, because these stocks, what determines whether a stock is priced correctly, there's lots of different factors. It's the profitability of that company. How many shares are in circulation? Because the more shares in circulation, the less value, the less valuable they are. Because on a per share basis, if you take the profit of that company and split it up over the, over the number of shares that are existing, then uh, the more shares that you're divvying it up by, the less value each share is going to have. And so when it comes to, well, how much am I willing to pay on a per share basis for this business? Uh, it's like buying a business, it's like buying a company. You know, just what we tend to do is we look at, okay, if we were to buy all of the shares in this company and buy the business outright, what kind of returns are we getting? What net value and what net assets are we are we earning? You know, what equity is in the business? But we also look at, okay, and what's the profitability of that business? So if I'm paying 4.6 billion, how much profit am I getting every year? If I was to own the whole business and get 100% of the profit, be the sole owner of this company, would it be producing a good return on investment? You can work that out pretty simply. Then I divvy it up across the number of shares. And that gives you a pretty good idea on a per share basis of how much you know that, that business is making and, and whether or not the shares are priced at a level that makes sense relative to the underlying performance of that company. And so my report goes out to my clients and it shows them these are all the companies whose share prices are right now this week priced at a level that makes sense to be buying them. And here's the range we're looking for. So if the prices change tomorrow, this is the threshold you're looking for. If it goes to this, don't buy anymore. Like that's your limit. Uh, anything below this figure is awesome. Anything below this figure is a bargain. And it's a, a traffic light system, basically. Green means it's a bargain. Uh, orange means decent. Red means this is the most we would pay for it. Anything above that, generally speaking, is you're overpaying for it. Now, there are some cases where our clients will overpay for shares. If they love that business and they're desperate to own shares in that company and the growth of that company suggests that buying today may end up still being a bargain in five years' time because of the growth of that stock and the growth of that share price. You know, buying today, you may well find that if you bought £5 today, in five years' time, we might be willing to pay £10, but you got in at five years earlier at £5. And so there's still some justification to overpaying for shares now if the growth of that stock makes sense, if the growth pattern and history of that stock suggests they're going to be a much bigger business in the future. So again, there's you know that aspect to it as well. And that's all explained in my report to my clients. But that's what a shrewd investor will do. They will know the right stocks that they're looking for. And they'll be actively buying them at the right price. There's no sitting out and waiting for the prices to get nice and high. And then you jump back in and you just buy Tesco and BP and, you know, BT and the staple companies that everybody's heard of. But actually aren't really performing. So I hope that gives you some kind of insight into how we 
pick stocks, but also knowing when we should be selling those stocks uh, and the difference between what the vast majority of amateur investors do to what we do. And, and, and hopefully you'll notice there the marked difference in amateurs using price to dictate their actions, whereas a shrewd investor, long-term investor, will be looking at the underlying performance of the business and the price only dictates when it's the right time to buy that stock. That's the mark, that's the that's the the kind of obvious difference between the two approaches and this is what makes all the difference to success and failure in investing in long-term stocks. But uh, I'm going to wrap it up. I I hope it's been a useful episode. Uh sorry for any background noise that you can hear. We've got some scaffolding being put up and it's not being done quietly, of course. So uh, it may well be bleeding through. But uh going to wrap it up. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, just a quick nod that if you are interested in joining the membership, we've got a couple of spaces open right now. Uh, we have sent a list, uh, a message out to everybody who's on the waiting list, but we still have two spaces. There's some people I'm an R in and about joining. Uh, if you are quick enough and if you're interested, you can jump in. And the best way to do that would be to email me, chris at chrischillingworth.com. Uh, drop me a line and just let me know that you're interested in joining. And uh, I can then take it from there and send you some links and some information. Uh, if uh, Otherwise, the a great place to go, if you haven't done so already, is the free How to Get Started Investing course that's on my website. That's at chrischillingworth.com. So that's Chris Chillingworth, all one word, C H I L L I N G Worth dot com. Go there uh, and you'll direct you straight to the free course. And it's a, a, a 15 videos, I think it is, that I uh, put together. And it's a hand holding process from complete rookie beginner, never invested before in their lives. Talks to you about how to uh, open a brokerage account, how to navigate their websites, you know, the mindset, uh, kind of the approach that you want to be taking when it comes to picking stocks, that sort of thing. Uh, it's all there in the course and it's completely free, no obligation to do anything else afterwards. But if it's something that you would be interested in, please go and do it. Um, please go check it out. But yeah, thanks very much for listening. I'll see you guys next week. Cheers. <laughs>